Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 24th meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome uh, my colleagues and welcome uh, witnesses I'll uh, introduce shortly. And can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other electronic devices uh, so they don't interfere with the committee's work. Um, we are a little bit down on numbers this morning. We have apologies uh, from three members who uh, are either unwell or have to be elsewhere, uh, Dennis Robertson, uh, Richard Lyle and Joan Lamont. Uh, we have two other uh, members who are hit, are hit by travel delays, uh, but I'm hoping will join us shortly, Patrick Harvey and uh, Joan McAlpin. Um, and we have one witness also hit by a travel delay who uh, I'm hoping will be with us shortly. Uh, item one on the agenda, can I ask if committee members are uh, content to delegate to the convener responsibility for arranging for the SPCB to pay under Rule 12.4.3 any expenses or witnesses to the inquiry? Agreed. That is agreed. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> item two on our agenda, we are continuing to take evidence on our inquiry into work wages and well-being in the Scottish labour market. I'd like to welcome our first panel. We're joined today by Colin Borland, who is Senior Head of External Affairs at the Federation of Small Business, uh, Alan Spence, Director of Accord Energy Solutions Limited, uh, Duncan White, who is a Senior Campaigning Officer with the UK Home Care Association, and Dr Matthew Dutton, Senior Research Fellow, Employment Research Institute, Edinburgh Napier University. Welcome to you all. There are a number of issues I think we're keen to explore uh, with you this morning. Uh, I should say Robert Kilgower of uh, Dow Investments is on his way, so he should be joining us shortly. Um, a number of issues we're keen to explore this morning around um, wage levels, questions around the, the, the living wage, uh, zero hours contracts, looking particularly at um, the involvement of small businesses, uh, the work of the government agencies in promoting uh, fair work, the Fair Work Convention, um, the question of um, the Scottish Government's business pledge, questions around trade union involvement in business, and also looking at different models of ownership, such as uh, employee ownership and what impact uh, that will have. So quite a, quite a range of topics we want to cover, and I think we'll try and run, run this till about 11 o'clock, so for about an hour and 15 minutes. And because there, there are or will shortly be five of you, please don't feel you should all answer every question, um, otherwise we'll be here for a long time. So I'd ask um, my colleagues if they would uh, direct their questions initially at one panel member, and then if you want to come in and respond to a point made uh, by somebody else, if you just catch my eye, I'll bring you in as best I can as the time allows. I think we'd like to start by looking at some issues around different models of ownership and the impact that employee-owned businesses might have. And I'll ask uh, Chick Brodie to ask the first question. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I think initially I'd like to direct this to, to Alan Spence, but of course if anyone else wishes to contribute, please do so. The, the benefits of employee ownership have been discussed in a, a number of the occasions that we've, we've been um, taking witness. Um, Research commissioned by the Employee Ownership Association found that employees in employee-owned businesses uh, report high levels of satisfaction, job quality, um, in terms of contributed by things like improved communications, decision-making, job satisfaction, uh, etc. So I wonder if you would care to comment on what you see as the general above-average quality of job because of that participation and employee ownership. I wonder if Mr Spence would advise what Accord have been doing, apparently. OK. Um, <clears throat> maybe worth giving some background. Accord was uh, established uh, in order to take a, a business model that uh, myself and two colleagues had developed um, to the next stage. We, we'd uh, developed a very open style of management with a very flat... Um, structure in the organization and we found that that uh, gave very good results and we felt that the next step in the development of that model was to um, I guess to introduce an element of employee ownership so when we founded Accord five years ago uh, it was to basically to develop that model further um, and we also had the the intention of trying to attract good people and retain them because we felt that 
uh, that would set us apart as a business. It would differentiate ourselves, us from our competitors, and uh, hopefully lead to uh, lead to success. We've uh, very well, fairly quickly grown to 35 staff with uh, around a dozen or more uh, external consultants uh, oh, supporting us. Sorry, from from when? From 2010. 2010. Okay. Yeah. So we developed uh, very quickly, and uh, I think it, it's very easy to focus on the turnover and the, the financial aspects of the business, and those have been very good. You know, we're turning over six million a year, um, but I think what's more gratifying and probably a better reflection of the model is the fact that in that period of time we've only lost three people, so three people have moved on. So. Uh, that in itself, I think, speaks volumes for the the type of uh, model and the way we operate the business. In, in terms of just, if I may sort of get into the detail, but uh, in terms of employee ownership, clearly there's a, there's an aspect of uh, uh, legal compliance and, and governance. Uh, what percentage of ownership, for example, in the company is there by, uh, ownership by employees? I mean, presumably you still retain the capability with a two-thirds majority requirement or, or not to make decisions. Uh, we operate very much as a normal business uh, with a board of directors. But above the board of directors, we have uh, a board of trustees, an employee ownership trust. And uh, the trustees are actually the governance body of the organisation. So they are effectively... Um, ensuring that the, the company is operated in the best interests of the employees, the best long-term interests of the employees, so they can hold the board to task if, uh, if they feel that that, uh, that duty isn't being um, exercised. The, um, as we were the first company to be employee-owned from start-up, the way that we're distributing equity in the company is, is really based on the profits of the company. The, the plan is that the employee ownership trust will own 51% of the company and that the employees will, uh, will effectively, through a share incentive plan, of own 30% of the company. At the moment, employees, through the share incentive plan, which is a very tax efficient way of doing it, uh, own uh, just over 20% of the company. The Employee Ownership Trust owns 15% of the company on behalf of employees. Uh, but the Employee Ownership Trust, because of the nature of its uh, governance role, also has a golden or preference share. And that preference share allows them effectively to outvote anyone else. So the company can't be sold unless in very special circumstances where uh, the founder directors, the Employee Ownership Trust, and at least 70% of the employees uh, believe that it's the appropriate action to the circumstances at the time. Interesting. Any, anyone else like to comment? Dr Tutton? Um, yeah, I thought it was particularly struck by what Alan said about the low job turnover. We, we spoke to, including Accord, we also spoke to about 13 employee ownership businesses as part of our research. And low job turnover was one of the striking features of the employee-owned businesses because people felt like they had a stake in the business and they felt like they were being listened to. Uh, and, you know, that for us was particularly uh, noticeable in terms of, you know, what the employees were reporting. I wonder how that impacts or what the view is of the FSB in terms, I know, you know, we're talking small businesses, but there are small and small businesses. Uh, what's what's the view of the FSB in terms of inclusive, inclusion of employees in small businesses? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think while we haven't done any specific work on um, different ownership models, I think there is a body of um, evidence that employees in micro-businesses are amongst the most satisfied. Um, and that is because, for the reasons that you cite, because they feel more involved, they have more of a, um, you know, a stake in the business, they're closer to the people who are making the ultimate decisions. So, you know, for those reasons, if they feel they've got more ownership of that job, whether or not they have a formal stake in the company, um, that tends to lead to higher job satisfaction levels, yes. Okay. I'd like to come back later on 
specifically in talking to uh, Mr. White about that aspect in the care sector, but I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, I'll just before I bring in Gordon McDonald, I just welcome Robert Kilgower, um, CEO of Down Investments. Thank you for, for joining us. For, uh, there were no leaves on the line. It was just the bad traffic from yes. Fife. Uh, thank you. Well, well, as you might have noticed, um, we have two members of the committee missing for similar reasons to do with uh, traffic disruption. So we had a little light on this side of the table as well. Anyway, we'll come back to you in a second. Gordon McDonnell, you want to pursue this? Yes, yeah, please. Th yeah. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, good morning. I would just want to continue this theme that uh, Chick Brody was asking about. And I was struck by um, the written evidence from Klansman Dynamics about uh, their employee ownership change where they, they flagged up turnover was up 90%, profits up 140% and employment up 30%. But the, the aspect I was wanting to ask you about, and probably this is Dr Dutton, uh, because you carried out a survey of a number of uh, employee ownership companies, what effect was there on um, sickness absence, um, disciplinary levels and productivity levels, if, if, if any findings that you found in those levels? Bearing in mind that, you know, um, recruitment costs, we, we, we've seen in evidence elsewhere, it's roughly about £3,500 per employee to recruit. Uh, well, we spoke to Klansmen, uh, we spoke to senior management, and we spoke to individual engineers on the floor, so to speak, as well. And what they said was absenteeism, sickness, and job turnover were, were negligible. Okay, now, you can't just assume that that is negligible because it's in your B. But it did appear to be the case that employees uh, genuinely believed they had a stake in the business, they were genuinely listened to in the business, um, and also because of the share ownership structure, uh, that the employees' uh, activities and actions were directly aligned with the business itself. So they felt that they had a genuine stake in the business. And in fact, Klansman is quite interesting as an example because they held what was called, I think it was called the, the Friday pizza meetings, okay, where everybody would, would get together on a Friday afternoon uh, for, an, for an hour or so. Uh, the staff would be you know, given pizzas and, and, uh, and some drinks as well. And that time would be used to raise any issues that any of the staff or any of the management wanted to discuss with the staff. Um, and some of the some of the staff I spoke to were initially quite uh, intimidated by this idea that you know you would be talking openly with managers about things that may be bothering you, uh, and it may have taken some time for that style of meeting to to iron itself out and find its feet. But eventually, almost all the staff seemed to agree that that was a genuinely useful and productive way of improving the way the business was being run, because they felt you know they could discuss things with management, they could raise issues. They could get things changed as well, rather than having a grumble, you know, away from managers, as often happens in the workplace. We all, you know, have a moan about people that we work with, but that really encouraged a kind of openness and transparency to the way the business was operated. Right. So, I mean, in terms of productivity, that presumably freed up a lot of managerial time and supervision time in order to concentrate and grow in the business rather than... Well, what you find with on the question of productivity, and again, mm -hmm. it, you have to be careful making direct links between increased productivity and it being an EOB, but it would appear to suggest that you have um, this apparent link between productivity and uh, being an EOB because issues are raised, are, are addressed at, at the centre, so to speak, and not just left to drift. Okay, so again, it's, it's the evidence is, because it's qualitative, you've got to take it with a, you know, a pinch of salt. But there's a suggestion that because issues are being raised, they're not being left, uh, problems which might cause people to leave the workforce are being you know, addressed by management and they're being raised openly that you know, there's this possibility that that may be having an effect on turnover. I think the bigger issue on turnover is the, f the point about the share ownership, is that employee share, share ownership is, a, is a, a very efficient way of aligning the interests of the company with the uh, aims of the individual employees. They can see what they're doing has a direct impact on the day-to-day -day running of the business. And in terms of the, the, the companies that you spoke to, were they in one particular sector or were they a range of sectors? They were a range or? of sectors. Uh, we, had, we had 12 companies in total across Scotland. They're all Scotland-based. Um, but they included uh, you know, oil and gas sector, uh, engineering sector. We had 
manufacturing sector involved. We had consultancy service, health services. So it was a reasonable spread of, of uh, businesses involved. Um, so, again, some caution about the numbers of businesses because we were commissioned by Scottish Enterprise to focus on these 12 businesses. Um, but that said, you know, when you start to get recurring themes coming up, such as, you know, job, you know, job well-being, uh, employee satisfaction, low levels of job turnover, uh, you know, improved productivity, then it, it starts to, you know, tell you a certain story about what's going on in EOBs compared to the non-EOB sector. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask uh, Colin Borland a couple of questions. Um, you, you've quite rightly pointed out that uh, the vast majority of businesses in Scotland are small businesses employing less than or around 10 people. Um, how many of your 19,000 members are um, employee ownership businesses? It's not something that we've done um, any work on. It's not something that we've asked. I would imagine, though, anecdotally, um, I would imagine the numbers would be small. Uh, you know, given the, the savings to the business and the, the, the situation we're in where um, we're, we're trying to encourage businesses to grow and there is a lot of um, businesses that are family-owned businesses that you know sometimes fail when they reach second or third generation or they, you know, somebody retires and the business goes out. Is there, is there any encouragement, any support within FSB as a way of handing businesses over from you know, one model to the other. I think succession planning is something that does get overlooked because we all want to talk about setting up a business because that's exciting and then growing it because that's also exciting. We don't like to talk about exit because that seems how we're somehow talking about failure. So yes, I think we do have to have better conversations about how one exits a business. One thing that we have encountered though is that you will see a bit in, when, it's, when it's your business and you set it up and your house is on the line and everything else, you can be reluctant to let other people in. Um, and we see that with um, equity partners or other investors or other types of investment that involve giving up um, an equity stake. There has historically been a level of resistance to that amongst the small business community in Scotland. So if we are going to go down that route, then you would have to start looking at some of those um, cultural questions as well. And is that, uh, does it require some level of support in order to give owners confidence that this is maybe a way to help stabilise their business or grow their business? I think what you need is when, you, uh, when you're beginning to think about it, um, and at some point it's not as if people are unaware of the fact that they're getting older or the fact that there's no one there to take it. When, when you begin to take it, when you begin to have those discussions, the initial contact that you have with the business support system has to be a good one, and it has to put you in touch with the right people first time. Because if it's not right, then businesses will ignore that um, or they're not going to go back a second time so we have to make sure I'm not sure generally saying to people this is a brilliant idea in general bear this in mind because those messages will wash over them if they're not interested in it at that time but it's when they come to make that inquiry that we make sure that this is one of the suite of you know options that's presented to them right. okay thanks so much I was just going to make a point about with agreeing with what Colin said about the resistance within some businesses to take part in that AUB structure. Several of the businesses that we spoke to had said that their former partners were resistant to becoming AUBs because they felt like over the years they'd taken the risks. They'd, as Colin said, they'd put their houses on the line. Therefore, why should they hand over, you know, what they'd essentially taken huge risks to do, you know, for the wider benefit? But maybe it just takes a greater, you know, vision to see beyond that. Okay, yeah, just, just before I bring Chick back in, I'm interested to maybe just pursue this with, with yourself, Dr. Dutton, and then Mr. Spence. Um, some of the challenges around employee ownership. Uh, for years, you know, the flagship employee ownership business in Scotland was Tullus Russell. Now, I sadly have to sit on the Tullus Russell task force that is trying to deal with the aftermath of the business folding. Um, is there any sense that an employee ownership business finds it harder to take difficult decisions? Because the employees are part of the employee. You know, for example, I'm, 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 maybe Tullis Russell isn't the best example because I think the business model probably made it, with the, with the international competition, it, it was very difficult for that business to, to succeed under any ownership model. But if the decisions had to be taken to substantially downsize, for example, would it be harder to take those decisions 
with an employee leadership uh, model? Uh, there was no evidence to suggest that de- harder decisions were uh, not made or were deferred. There was some evidence to say that decision making took longer, perhaps. Now, maybe that could feed into you know some cases where that might lead to problems. Um, of course, in the case of Telus Russell, it, it's maybe an EOB, but it's not operating in a bubble. It's operating in an international marketplace, and, and at the time, a very difficult one. Um, so, no, in response to that point, no evidence directly relating to uh, you know difficult decisions being deferred. Um, but perhaps some suggest decision making was slower. Okay, now from what I heard speaking to the employees and the, and the managers. I wouldn't assume that difficult decisions wouldn't be made for that reason, because one of the things that was emphasised to us was the openness and transparency of the way in which decisions were made. Now, presumably, when a, a difficult decision did come along, that should be in the open too, you might think. Okay, but I don't have the, the details of the individual cases, of course. Mr Spence, do you want to say anything yes, about this? Actually, yeah. um, we're in a very difficult position as you can imagine at the moment uh, we're in the oil and gas business uh, many of the major operators are our clients and uh, we're seeing levels of activity dropping we're seeing quite a bit of pressure on um, our rates um, and we're seeing decisions being taken not on the quality of the service but but the cost of the service so just uh, last week uh, I was down with a client and Basically, we were told we'd have to cut our rates by 20%. Uh, and those are rates that were already discounted significantly. So we're at the, with that client, we're going to be at the margins of making money and not making money. But we don't really have a choice as to, we can't walk away because there isn't that much business out there. So obviously, you know, we've already thought about our strategy for, for how we continue the business for as long as possible. We already put in place, um, I think, some measures to allow us to get through this downturn. One of the things that, you know, because we've been in this business for a long time, we recognise that uh, oil industry can be very boom and bust. And we have taken measures to ensure that we have uh, sufficient financial resources in place to keep the company going for much longer. So rather than um, taking profits out of the company, uh, to uh, reward employees or to sell our shares to, to the company, we've built up uh, a reasonable amount of money in the bank, which we feel is, is prudent. Um, so that will help us. But additionally, we've been looking at how do we respond? You know, we get more uh, clients cutting rates if, if more work dries up. And we've effectively drawn up a league table of where we start cutting to ensure that... Uh, the business remains viable until the, uh, the industry uh, meets some sort of upturn. And at the very end of that list is uh, redundancies. So it is not the first thing uh, we, we go for. It's the very last thing we go for. And we've communicated that to our staff and we'll communicate it again because obviously they're concerned for their jobs. But we need to make them aware that... Uh, that that is a last resort. We're not looking to maintain profit levels. We're, we're happy to, you know, not make a profit, even potentially make a loss. We're in a position where we can do that, um, but um, we have to face the future uh, with a, a low oil price. Um, and I think, you know, one aspect of what we do, you know, Matthew referred to the, uh, the pizza meetings at uh, Klansman. One of the things that we do is we have a, a monthly staff meeting. And at that staff meeting, um, as well as all the general day-to-day uh, issues with running the company, we also prevent, uh, present the, uh, the monthly profit and loss accounts to the staff. So the staff know exactly how much money's in, how much co- is coming in, how much is going out, um, where it's going, what the problems are, what the issues are. So they understand the finances of the company as well as everyone, as the directors. And uh, it would not come as a surprise to them you know, to know that exactly what I've said, we are facing pressure, uh, turnover is going down, profits are going down. Um, and so I think they recognise that 
the management team are doing everything they can to uh, address the issues and to see the company through uh, this, this difficult period. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chick, do you want to come back in? Yeah, just, just briefly, uh, perhaps to talk to Colin. By the way, I, the company, I have an American company I was with, we used to have the Friday feast, uh, which is drinks and sandwiches at half past four. But you had to get the meeting over pretty quickly because too much drink afterwards led to other complications. Um, <clears throat> I wonder, Colin, one of the burgeoning sectors of our economy is the social enterprise and third sector. Uh, which is largely employee-owned, if, if, if you like. Is, is it, in your opinion, just employee ownership, or is there a, a defined change in culture uh, that you can discern in that sector? We don't have many social enterprise members at the moment. We have got some that are now joining. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure um, that, it, that necessarily the ultimate objective uh, makes that much of a difference because when people talk to me about what social enterprises are there to do then it does sound awful like what a lot of our members are there to do which is to provide employment <laughs> deliver services you know be an, an important part of that community the only real difference is i suppose that you know most businesses um are there with you know the primary objective of making profits and a social enterprise has you know an additional um you know goal over and above that but in terms of you know how the teams are structured, how they're motivated, and all the rest of it. Um, I'm not aware of any significant differences, although my answer to that might change with our membership profile to change in the years ahead when we had a greater number of members in that sector. Okay. I wanted to come back to Alan Spencer's uh, very interesting comments about the sector in which he operates and how the employee ownership model makes a difference. The, the last period of sustained low oil price at the turn of the century uh, in the late 90s and, and 2000 saw an awful lot of people laid off and 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 a, an almost default position by companies in the sector of, of, of reducing staff costs first or, or very early um, what you've described is an attempt to do quite the opposite of that but we had some discussion in this inquiry a couple of weeks ago as to whether your response was typical or whether a lot of companies are again defaulting to reducing staff costs first. What, in, in your view, from operating in the sector at the moment, what is the sector's response to the current position? And, and what difference does it make as to how a business is owned and operated uh, in terms of, the, of, of those choices that are made about how to reduce costs in difficult times? I think uh, certainly in the UK, sorry, in the, on the UK continental shelf, um, where it's mostly uh, private companies that are operating. Um, those companies are driven by shareholder returns. And the shareholders are not necessarily, uh, don't take a long-term view of the business. It's very much a short-term view of the business. Um, it's about getting, generating as much money from their ownership of shares in the business as possible. And because of that, most of the goals of the, uh, the board of directors uh, reflect that. So while it would, be, it would be wrong to say that they don't have a long-term view, there's also very much this short-term view of returning shareholder value, uh, and often to the expense of, uh, of the employees of those companies. Often it's the first step that's taken is to, to look at reducing the cost base through uh, paying off members of staff. And, and certainly contractors is, is an easy cut for many of them. Um, I think for, for us, we're, we're different in that we don't have any external shareholders. We're able to take a long-term view. And I can go a bit further back to, uh, to the 1980s, uh, when the oil price dropped from $30 to $10 a barrel. So I've been through this cycle two or three times, and, and I, I'm quite sure that, uh, that things will improve. Uh, but it's just about getting through that period. And, and you make your choices with a, an employee-owned business where the money stays within the business, uh, and really you're looking to ensure that the business operates in the best long-term interests of its employees, then the option of paying off people has to be the last option that you take. And 
clearly, clearly that's of benefit to the people who work in the business yeah. uh, because they don't face the uh, redundancy situation, the uncertainties that, that many of their peers currently face. Is there a benefit to the business itself in terms of retaining skilled and experienced staff? Does that reduce your costs, so to speak, when the, when the upturn finally comes? Well, yes. I mean, certainly uh, recruitment costs are, are exceptionally high for, for the type of people that, uh, that, we, that we employ. So there's an issue there. But there's also a, a sort of a secondary effect there, which I was trying to explain to some of our clients, and it's, it's quite difficult for them to get it. But because we're a consultancy uh, and uh, high-end engineering business, um, our consultants are often... Uh, based in client offices for prolonged periods of time. They build up an understanding of that client's business and uh, they become almost a, a re relied upon source of knowledge within that client's business. The value that we provide to those clients is that with low turnover, we can provide those people for a long term and so they get that quality of service that they they demand, but also um, they don't have to bring in new people from other businesses or even from ourselves if, if we lose people. They don't have to bring in new people and take them through that whole process of, uh, of understanding the business, of understanding the challenges, the technical challenges and so on and so forth. So for our clients, having this long-term approach, this long-term view is actually very valuable at the moment, they're not prepared to recognise that, but you know, I, I think there is that secondary benefit from being an employee in the company. Yep. So business benefits both to yourself, yourselves, and to your yes. cli the client companies. I wonder if, I, if, if either yourself or, or, or Dr. Dutton or, or others have a view. Um, it's clearly this is clearly an, an ownership model which delivers great benefits to both employee owners and the business in, in the way you've described it. Is there any reason other than inertia for such a low level of employee-owned businesses in the economy? Is it simply that others have not discovered what you've discovered in terms of uh, developing the model from, from, from the start and, and, and what more can be done to, 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 to make it more accessible to more people? Well, actually, the, the number of employee-owned companies, both in Scotland and the UK as a whole, is growing uh, faster than it's ever grown before. The employee employee-owned companies uh, generate uh, more revenue than the whole of the aerospace sector in the, U in the UK. So it is employee-owned companies contribute quite significantly. And uh, through my involvement with uh, Cooperative Development Scotland as, as an ambassador, we are seeing regular inquiries uh, about companies that are looking at employee ownership as a way forward. Probably going back to something that was said earlier, um, about 80%, I think, of uh, companies that become employee-owned become employee-owned because of succession issues, uh, because the, the owners have a long-term uh, view, they've built up the business over a considerable period of time, they have probably a significant presence in the area, and when they do come to retire, leave the business, um, they, fi they find that the most palatable way of doing that is to sell the business to their employees. And, well, I make a point about the actual you know, difficulties with becoming EOBs and why there's perhaps your question was related to why there are not more. Okay, obviously the dominant model in the private sector is external shareholders, not the internal shareholder model. Okay, but some of the issues that were raised with us was the complexity of moving your business into an EOB model. Um, I don't know if this was Alan's experience at all, but certainly in the case of the companies that we spoke to. They described um, an enormously complicated system uh, under HMRC regulations uh, to do with becoming employee-owned. Now, many of them thought that that was valid in some cases to protect, you know, the I suppose that the reasons why businesses would become EOBs to make sure that people were becoming EOBs for the right reasons. Um, but there was also felt to be some uh, difficulty from the companies that we spoke to in terms of accessing additional finance um, because of that shareholding model that the EOBs had was that their impression was that the banks were a little bit more 
uh, uncertain about what they were, a little bit less sure because they had less experience in doing, dealing with EOBs. Therefore, they couldn't look to those external sources of finance for growth that other companies may be able to do. But on the other side of that, that by not having those external shareholders to meet those kind of short-term demands, uh, and your shareholders are your employees, and your employees' uh, actions are aligned with the business <laughs> aims, it does give you that long-term stability, and it does give you a long-term long view. Can I just make this time? Brief point on that, I think Alan and Matthew are both absolutely correct to be talking about companies here. It's important to remember there's an awful lot of businesses in Scotland that are not constituted as a limited company. Um, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but I think it's about half. So, the opportunity there then is if you're moving from a sole trader model to become a partnership and bring somebody in, or if you're a partnership and bring another partner on, obviously that employee doesn't just get to share in, in the, how much money the business makes, you also become liable for all of the business's debts as well. So I think, um, yes, there are specific issues round about um, company law and how we um, deal with a limited company, but just remember that's completely off the, um, you know, off the table for anyone who's uh, constituted as a partnership or a sole trader. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, uh, <clears throat> I was just going to say that our experience um, was perhaps different from some of the other uh, companies that, that Matthew interviewed. Um, in setting up the business, we found it was actually uh, very straightforward and very simple uh, to set up our share incentive plan and to uh, set up our employee ownership trust. Um, it wasn't particularly expensive in terms of the overall uh, turnover of the business and uh, it certainly would have posed a barrier to, to setting up the business as being an employee-owned business. And you didn't encounter the issues around banks and other external... Um, we recognised that, I mean, the first time we, we really uh, got involved with the bank was uh, after our first year. Um, James and Phil and I uh, left as the management team of a, a, a small part of a, a large multinational and our contracts precluded us uh, from employing anyone who'd worked for us uh, within that company. So we had a, a one-year period where those restrictive covenants uh, prevented us from employing uh, former employees. Um, but we recognised that there was a good chance that... Uh, a significant number of those people would join us after that first year. Uh, so our first dealings with the bank were to request a, an overdraft facility. And uh, the bank were, were very supportive and uh, it wasn't a, an issue at all. We, in fact, didn't have to use it, but we did grow quite significantly in that second year. And uh, But our, our fears over uh, cash flow were, were unfounded. Thank you very much. Can I go back to Paul Morland? On the question he's made around um, the limited partnerships, Sim simply to understand better the, this question about succession uh, and, and succession, as, as Matthew Dutton described, of family traders or sole traders who, who, who wish to uh, retire. What, what in, in, in general terms, would be the experience of, of yourselves in dealing with members? Do they come to you for advice about different models of succession or uh, do you proactively offer that kind of advice? Is there a, a mechanism for those discussions to happen for micro-businesses and small businesses? Our function in that would be primarily a signposting one. So we would send them to the, you know, the publicly available um, support that is there. And if people do come to you and actually ask about that sort of stuff, they've taken four or five steps already. Do you know what I mean? They are towards the door, they're roughly where you want them to be. The bigger challenge, I think, as co colleagues have outlined, is how you get them thinking about that and moving in the right direction before it's too late, I guess. Thanks. OK, I think um, we, we should move on and talk about some other issues. We've had quite a, quite a good discussion around employee ownership. Um, one of the other themes we've been looking at in relation to the inquiry is the whole question of, of wages. Um, we wanted to focus in particular on two sectors. One was retail and one was the care sector. So I wonder if I maybe start with yourself, Mr. White, and bring in Mr. Kilgour too, looking at the 
This whole question of, of, of wages, um, we know that uh, the Scottish Government through the Fair Work Convention is very keen to promote the concept of the living wage. We also know that the UK Government are bringing in the, the national living wage from um, next, next year, uh, rising to uh, £9 an hour by 2020. You say in your submission, Mr White, that the UC, UK HCA feels that the new national living wage could lead to a and I quote, catastrophic failure of home-based care services. Can you just elaborate on that and explain what, why you think that is the case? Uh, thank you. Um, I think the home care sector, in many instances, is, is, is very different from, from other sectors in as far as the vast majority of the business conducted in the home care sector is publicly funded. And certainly UK-wide, it's, it's in excess of 70% of, of the, the contracts and the fees that go with that are publicly funded. That then brings us into an immediate problem. If, if the fee rates in publicly funded contracts are so narrow, the, the, the margins are so narrow, and the fee rates themselves don't reflect the actual costs of care, if you raise a single component within those actual costs of care, i.e. The, the, the wage that you pay to your staff, uh, without uh, a matching increase in fee levels then you, you, you just squash the, the whole economic model to the extent that it becomes non-viable and, and that um, in terms of trying to sustain a, a viable market, in terms of trying to sustain a corporate or company provision of care, it just becomes impossible. And certainly in our most recent surveys of providers, both at large, intermediate and small level, we are astonished, to be quite honest, at how many companies and providers out there are actively looking at novating and handing contracts back to local authorities. Um, there are legal issues around that, but undoubtedly the cost model uh, is so fragile that if you extend and, and propel pay systems, pay propelling measures like the living wage, national living wage, disproportionate to the fees that you're receiving back, you simply cannot provide a service. It, it is not economic to do so. So when we say that um, the national living wage could have catastrophic effects on the home care market, I don't think that's a, an overstatement um, or a wow factor. It, it, it's a reflection of reality. Um, Mr Colgaro, do you want to add to that? <coughs> yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, yeah, the two... Well, the care home business is one of my business interests. My main business interest, Renaissance Care, has 650 employees um, part and full-time at the moment. Our two biggest issues, without any doubt, are staff recruitment and retention following from that, and particularly nurse recruitment. Um, and the clarity that we now have about the living wage, we know that well, 60 to 65 percent of our income goes on... Um, uh, wages a large area of that is um, at, at the area at the end affected by the national living uh, living wage nine pounds by at minimum by April 2020 and at that end um, you've also got the differentials above that rate of employees paid slightly above that that have to be increased to keep the differential um, and we certainly found that uh, recently as well, that the threat of... Um, we have the clarity that we know that our biggest cost is going to be uh, going up between now and April 2020. What we don't have clarity on at all is the fee level, um, what's going to happen to the fee level um, and uh, between now and 2020. Um, and if it is just cost of living increases on an annualised basis, then we do have a crisis... Um, uh, on our hands in a sector that in Scotland 600 odd um, uh, independent care homes employing directly 30,000 people and secondary obviously on local goods and services employing uh, or assisting in the employment of, of many thousands uh, more and certainly in our company 75% of our income comes from local authorities um, who are quite happy to pay the living wage to their own um, staff in their own care homes where for a residential home the average fees can be as high as a thousand pounds the average cost 
and I have this under freedom of information from councils, about £1,000 a week, and yet they're um, uh, paying us six hundred currently £609 a week for nursing care, which involves nurses, whereas they don't involve nurses. So I think there needs to be a level playing field. Um, and, and I'm quite happy to, for us to have an open book policy, if the councils are, between the cost of care that councils are providing in their own care homes and the cost of care that we're providing, because uh, there is not a level playing field between uh, the cost of care. And councils are happy and, uh, to pay the living wage to the the Living Wage Foundation rate of 785, um, which most councils in Scotland are now doing to their care staff, um, but they're not prepared to pay us the fees uh, to pay the living wage. Uh, we would be quite happy to pay the living wage and pass 100% of that increase fee on to our staff because that would help, in our view, with staff recruitment and with staff retention. We, we took evidence on this last week from... Um, some trade unions and, and uh, Dave Watson from um, Unison um, was quite interesting and if I just try and paraphrase what he said in, in his view there were there were three types of employers there were there were the good employers who already paid the living wage there were the willing employers who um, wanted to pay the living wage but were constrained because of income and there were bad employers who just didn't want to pay it at all um, what, what you seem to be suggesting Mr Colgower is you're in the middle category of being being not 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 good nor bad, but willing, you would like you'd like to pay more, but you, you can't afford to do it. Well, our margins are are extremely uh, tight, um, uh, and that has been over the last um, pressures on that over the last eight to ten years. <coughs> excuse me, both on local authority fee rates and also on regulatory requirements, increased regulatory burden and requirements, which I'm quite um, uh, supportive of, from the care inspector as far as to the service and. Uh, and extra things that we have to uh, that require us to provide, which I'm fully supportive of. But I think for councils to pay their own staff in their own care homes uh, the living wage, but not be prepared to pay a decent rate to enable us who are willing to do that in in the independent sector and the charity sector, the voluntary sector, um, I think is unfair. And uh, certainly also from the costs to you get a council that says it doesn't have the money to pay us an increase, and yet on, on uh, I would build a, a new build care home, ignoring land cost at the moment, for about £75,000 a bed. East Lothian Council <coughs> provided me with information under Freedom of Information that their recent opened home in Tranent uh, down the road uh, they, it's actually cost them £170,000 a bed more than twice what the independent sector would cost to build a bed. You, you could ask the question, why are they building a care home and spending um, £10 million on building a 60-bed care home when it would cost us just over £4 million to build? Um, so th there is a... And therefore, that has an ongoing <laughs> weekly cost. Um, if it's more than twice the cost to build it, then you've got to pay that... Uh, even councils have to pay that uh, money back. There is, certainly is... Uh, unfair competition from uh, councils who um, uh, uh, plead poverty on the one hand and on the other hand um, their own cost of care for a lesser service without nurses is way above what they're prepared to pay us for a service including nurses. Mr Wright. I'd like to pick up on a couple of points made by Robert Kilgour there. Um, very interesting to note his, his point about the, the open book accounting approach. Um, and I would certainly like to, to develop that line of thinking. However, to just mention first that the UK Home Care Association has calculated nationwide that an hour of home care costs the provider £15.74 to provide. Uh, a recent Freedom of Information survey of every local authority in the entire United Kingdom showed that the average fee paid by local authorities is £11.36 per hour. So there's automatically, immediately, a great de uh, difference there. Uh, and to pick up on, on Robert's point about the open book accounting, in a couple of local authorities where we have succeeded in entering into an open book accounting process to identify with local providers and the local authority actual costs of care, 
We have been quite successful, and it has been shown unequivocally in the far southwest of England, that the fees that were paid were wholly inadequate, and that those fees have been raised to £16 an hour from just under 12 uh, In another instance where we're, we're undertaking open book accounting, the local authority has realised that it is just not viable to pay in the region of £11.5 an hour for an hour of care by any stretch of the imagination. And I think the unfairness that, that Robert mentioned in terms of local authority provision versus private sector provision is also uh, a, a personal experience of mine where I sat down with a, a Yorkshire council a few months ago and we looked at in-house provision that comes out at about £39 an hour for reablement care compared to the fee paid to private providers of, of marginally over £13 an hour. And I think that sort of imbalance is a national trend. It is a national problem. Just to follow that, that up, I know other members want to come in, but, but I want to just get to ask you about this question, this issue of the ethical care charter. I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, but we, we, we were two weeks ago, the committee was in Paisley, we met Renfrewshire Council and they told us about the work they do with their ethical care charter and, and they have been uh, working with contractors uh, there to ensure the living wage is paid by those contracting council services, including care. And from what they said, they, you know, they seem to have had some, some success in that and it is based on an open book approach. Is that a model you think that, that, that works, that could be progressed further? Yes, uh, I think we would welcome that move um, in, in every sphere. I think it, we, would, we would champion that, that approach. Um, it is productive, it does engage with providers, it does support a viable, sustainable market, um, and it does provide an open book arrangement where people can see what the pressures are. I mean, we all clearly know that local authorities are under duress, but I think you know, there has to be a recognition that strategic decisions have to be made in the commissioning process. You know, commissioners have to make decisions around what strategically and long-term is sustainable. Okay. So yes, we would unequivocally support that. Maybe ask the same question to Robert Kilgour. Are you, are you familiar with this concept of the ethical care charter? Have you, uh, no, have, I mean, have, have you had any dealings with Renfrewshire Council? No, no. no they, um, uh, the homes we have are in um, Murray, Peterhead, four in Aberdeen, one in Blair Gowrie, and the rest in Edinburgh and East Lothian. Um, so, so no, I haven't. Um, but um, if we are prepared to open up our books and show... Um, how we make the small margins we make and where our pressure points are, uh, then it has to be um, that councils have to do that as well. And I don't find that they're, um, my experience, I've been involved in the care sector for 26 years. My experience is that, uh, and particularly recent experience, is that councils are actually hiding, are actually uh, making efforts to hide the true cost um, of uh, the weekly cost of their care in their own care homes because they're embarrassed about the level of uh, how, how the differential between their, the cost in their care homes and the cost in the independent sector. Thanks. Yeah, just on that last point, Bob Kilgour mentioned, uh, I spent the summer going around all in, in Ayrshire uh, care homes and, uh, and also talking to local authorities. Uh, I didn't find them hiding. I mean, I, I, I accept some of the points that you made, but I didn't find them trying to hide uh, questions. Can I uh, change uh, tack just a bit in terms of recruitment and retention? Because we are talking about wage is obviously a key element, uh, and it's uh, regrettable that we're not uh, uh, seeing living wage being paid across the sector. But what's the management, in your opinion, what's the management quality like in, in the care sector? Because clearly that has an implication both in looking at the incomes of those that uh, are at the front end and, and um, how well do you think the care homes generally are managed? I think considering what um, uh, it's, it, it's an area that I've been concerned about for a while that, that I'm not sure the managers and deputy managers of care homes, for example, I think the, the pressures that they are under from several different uh, quarters... Um, I think um, they do an exceptionally good job uh, under huge pressure. Um, but, I mean, the living wage, 
I'm a strong supporter of the living wage and I would love to be able to uh, introduce and pay in it the living wage across the entire group, whether it's the 785 or going up to the £9 by 2020. But as 75% of our business comes from local authorities and local authorities uh, refusing to um, pay the, uh, give us the fees to pay the living wage. I don't see... Um, I, well, the concerns I have in that area... Just on that point, maybe because it is very important in relation to, to the incomes of those in, in private care homes uh, as, uh, as well as local authority homes. What then is your view of the procurement process that's going on and, you know, and when that discussion comes up in, in terms of the issues that you face through that process in being able to pay the living wage to... Uh, Procurement, you mean? The procurement pro yeah, between you and the local authorities, for example. Well, local authorities, um, this is meant to be a choice for, for, for potential residents. Um, you come up against the bed blocking in NHS hospitals issue as well, where um, you've got the NHS, if an elderly person is in uh, a hospital bed, you've got that side of the NHS budget, and if they come out of the NHS hospital and go into a care home, that comes out of the social work budget. So there are pressures where uh, social work um, maybe are um, being slower at um, uh, placing out of uh, hospital. And then there's the question, um, which is maybe a bit uh, um, controversial, of are they giving preference um, in placements um, to... Um, places in their own care homes um, uh, as opposed to those in the voluntary or the independent sector. Um, but Lang and Buson, who are UK recognised as, as the leaders in, in health consultancy in this area, they, they published something recently where it was the first time ever, and it was between October 14 and March 15, there was a net loss of 3,000 beds uh, in the UK of, of, of um, care of the elderly beds. It's the first time ever. And they put that down to the margin pressures uh, on fee pressures and uh, the threat of the uh, impending living wage uh, issues. And the, so older homes are closing um, uh, at a faster rate and new homes are not being built. And this is, they said, was a growing trend. I mean, in Scotland, that might be 250, a net, I'd say 3,000 in the UK might be 250 to 300 net loss in, uh, in Scotland. So the concern that I would have is unless we get clarity, at the moment we have clarity over our biggest cost. I mean, are we going to survive as a business? There's going to be a crisis in the sector that's going to make the collapse of Southern Cross look like a picnic, in my view. Um, if we don't get clarity over our fee levels and some kind of level playing field between what the councils are spending in their own homes and what they're being prepared to pay us. Yeah. I'd like to pick up on a couple of points raised by Mr Brodie. Um, firstly, the quality of management in, in care sector and secondly, the procurement process. And I think our anxiety is that the, both of those entities are, are dominated by short-termism that it's a constant struggle to manage the tidal wave at any given point. Usually 4.30 on a Friday, there is a tidal wave of people in, that need to come out of hospital. Uh, and anecdotally, other, other issues around how service users, patients are transferred from hospital care to social care, be that nursing home or, or home care. I think... Uh, Management of social care is a constant struggle. You're running to stand still. You're up against constrained fees. You're up against uh, capacity problems because you can't afford, uh, because of short-term planning, you can't afford to recruit the staff numbers to absorb the sudden shocks of, of huge numbers of people coming out of hospital. And to pick up on Robert's point, in the financial year 2013 through 2014, the NHS spent £1.05 billion on delayed discharges, bed blockages. Now, that sort of money, if you were to transfer that to social care, nursing homes, home care, would be an extraordinary fillet to the system. I think in terms of procurement, it is characterised by perpetual, consistent short-termism. It's solving today's problems 
not looking at tomorrow, not looking at next week, let alone next year. Now, if we could get some sort of lined up, cohesive procurement commissioning model that says, OK, let's start looking at financial year 2017, 2018. Let's start thinking about the resource allocation. Let's have a look at resource pool. Let's have a look at capacity. Let's have a look at demand modelling so that we could we could put down on paper what we want the system in 2017-18 to do rather than struggling to solve Monday's problems on Tuesday. It's it's just madness. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Louis MacDonald. Uh, I'm, I'm intrigued. This is a, an inquiry into work wages and well-being in the labour market, and the care sector has been identified by witness after witness as one of the problem areas. Um, your response seems to be from the sector, well, it's all the fault of local councils, they need to give us more money, and then we can provide a better deal for our workforce. That's, that's what it sounds like, and of course, if you want to put me right, I'd be very interested to hear it. Can, can, can you, can you uh, tell me, is, what, what would your advice be if a member of your own family wanted to work in the care sector, from, from what your own experience is, what you've told us today? Would you say they'd be better to uh, seek a job in the local authority um, or in the health service, that appeared to be the implication of what was being said, rather than to work in the private sector. Is, is, uh, are you telling us that um, your market is a market failure and that you're no longer capable of delivering a service profitably uh, while sustaining your workforce? Well, I think um, to compete as we are um, doing our best to compete and continue to provide a uh, good quality of uh, care service when the 75% um, fee supplier to us is got their own um, uh, service provision that costs are way above what they feel um, they're happy paying, uh, paying us. That's where I feel the unfairness is. Um, that they are paying us um, a rate that is, in general terms, £609 a week for nursing care when their cost can be as high as um, £1,000 a week uh, for residential care with no nurses. So um, I, don't, I don't feel you're saying that, that the, the model is, uh, is broken. Well, I certainly know um, that uh, from colleagues in the same uh, business, we're all looking at um, which I think is bad for, for the business, how we increase our percentage of private residents, um, uh, private percentage of residents, which um, obviously uh, will kick back to the local uh, authority, will be shortages of, of beds back to the 3,000 uh, a year beds that are being lost throughout um, the UK. And if, if, if that happens, the other thing that I know a, a number of my colleagues in, in the sector are saying is they're actually uh, looking at closing homes. And there's no doubt that with the clarity over our biggest cost between now and 2020 and without any clarity and, and uh, over uh, the fee level in that basis, um, a lot of homes will close, more and more homes will close between now and 2020. Uh, that is definite, that's a fact, it's going to happen. Okay. Sorry, please. Yeah, I'd like to, to answer the question that you raise in terms of would I recommend or otherwise to a family member, would they work in the, uh, the health or social care sector? And I think that question is very ably answered by the dynamics of the recruitment market out there. 38% staff turnover. That tells you the answer of 38% of people out there is no, I don't want to work in social care. I think the crisis that is about to hit with nursing, and I am a nurse, so I, you know, hands up. Um, you know, there is a crisis with nursing. I haven't got the figures sitting in front of me, but we, we don't train enough nurses. We, we stop training nurses. Um, you only have to read the, the Roy Lilly um, newsletter to, to realise the, the grief that is going out on out there with nursing. I think in terms of the, the second question that you implied, in terms of what would be our advice to, to the system, I think it, it, it re rewinds to, to my statement to the previous question. I think if we can get away from short-termism, if we can get long-term planning into the system, if we can start deciding what we need the system to do, 
after the next 18, 24 months so that everybody in the market, everybody within the system has clear strategic direction, has a clear idea of what the commissioning disp disposition is so that you can say, OK, this is where home care sits, this is where nursing home sits, this is where hospitals sit, this is where accident emergency, paramedics. You get that whole constellation of organisations within that spectrum of health and social care lined up in a proper organised integrated way everything else will fall out of that once you introduce the investment not just cash which i think you you were sort of quite anxious that we seem to be pillaring local authorities for the lack of cash well yeah sure we are i mean we make no apology for that but i think it goes far beyond the readies that are available here and now for contracts it goes to making long-term strategic decisions planning and allocating what you want the system to do allocating bits within that system to specific roles and I think if you do that and you underwrite that with not just cash but also resources like nurse recruitment nurse training uh, SVQs things like that that your answer lies in that direction because standing still as we are now carrying on as we are now ain't an option I'm I was just saying that there is a huge um, there was, um, a recent survey done that showed that there's probably between 800 and 1,000 nurse vacancies in the care sector in Scotland um, currently um, at the moment. And certainly across what we have at the moment is it's about 57 vacancies, uh, 25 in uh, nurses, 20 carers, 10 ancillary and 2 in middle management. That's our current job vacancies that we have um, at the moment. Intrigued. I think, I think the, part of my concern is that when we've heard evidence about what makes working life difficult for people, yes, they talk about low wages and about uh, high uh, turnover, but there's also uh, evidence that uh, uh, low employee engagement, low prospects, poor prospects of progression, uh, poor opportunities for training, all these things are raised as well, and the care sector is focused uh, is in the focus there. So I'm, I'm interested to know what you as employers are doing about that, other than lobbying for more money for the public sector, which is quite legitimate. But what are you as employers doing? Do you recognise trade unions, for example? What progression arrangements do you have in place for your staff? Well, in training, certainly, we um, this year from last year, we've increased our training budget by uh, a third, and we're increasing it by 50% um, next year from this year. Um, uh, so training is a huge uh, part that that is partly on uh, to hopefully help with recruitment but also to help with staff retention as well because the staff turnover uh, rates vary home to home but they are certainly much higher than we would like to see and I think career progression and and training investment and training is something that we've uh, made a conscious decision to to ramp up and uh, uh, and increase. Um, I have. Uh, I would certainly recommend. I mean, there's nothing more. Uh, it's a very satisfying job if you speak to those who are involved in uh, at the coalface. Um, and uh, I just, um, I angst almost daily at the fact that I can't give uh, those members of my staff at the coalface uh, uh, more support than I do. Uh, both financially and in, in staff backup and in training. Um, I do the best that I can um, in, um, uh, in that area, but I would love to be able to do more, but we have huge um, constraints. We're back to um, the uh, um, uh, pressures uh, from local authorities. I understand local authorities are under huge pressures, um, but I think they, they need to look about where they're spending their money uh, in this area and and we need to have uh, a level playing field um, that's surely only fair do you recognize the trade union and if not what else do you do to engage staff we did recognize um, trade unions uh, but I think that's fallen away due to lack of interest amongst our staff um, I did ask that question of um, my operations director last week of, of Renaissance care who, because I said, didn't we recognise trade unions a couple of years ago, well, three years ago, I think it was, um, when we took on some homes from Southern Cross, actually, so maybe four years ago. Um, um, and she reminded me, yes, we did, but um, 
the lack of interest amongst um, our staff as it's just lapsed. And so it, currently at the moment, um, at the moment we don't. Have you any sense of why that would be, why low paid and secure members of staff would not want trade union representation? No, I don't. Um, uh, um, they had the opportunity um, when as part of the taking on the homes from the collapse of Southern Cross that we did, um, uh, we inherited that across and we were quite um, uh, comfortable and relaxed about that. But the take up and the, the ongoing, it's just um, fitted away and disappeared. Um, I know some other care home operators, my old company that I founded, Four Seasons Healthcare, I believe they do. Um, uh, but um, most of the sort of middle size, um, like ourselves, uh, don't. Fair to say that there is no huge ethical problem with trade union membership. It, it just doesn't happen, and, and that's very easy to say. I think you know, health, home care, adult social care, is firstly a very flat um, system. You know, it hasn't got a huge hierarchy with you know, sort of like ward sisters and nursing officers and senior nursing officers and principal nursing officers and whatever, whatever. I mean, that sort of hierarchical arrangement in home care just doesn't happen you know you you have at most perhaps a supervisor um or a liaison officer that works with the local authorities so you you don't have that huge progression that huge sort of successor arrangement and i think that is a problem i mean the lack of a career structure is undoubtedly um a break on on developing uh, the attractiveness of, of home care as a service um i think in, and, and certainly from the UK HCA's point of view, we have a membership of 2,200-something organisations, and they're entirely at liberty to, to recognise trade unions. We would certainly not give direction or, or offer any sort of advice. You know, that's an entirely localised business decision. But ethically, ideologically, absolutely no objection whatsoever to trade union members. And, you know, if, if the majority of our membership organisations came to us and said, you know, we want advice about this, then we give it. You know, I, I just don't see it as an issue, to be quite honest. So, so where, where employers don't have trade union recognition, and it sounds, from what you say, almost all of them don't have trade union recognition, what other steps do they take formally to consult staff and engage them in the running of the business? I mean, again, it, it, it's a very local issue, you know, and, and a big company with 35 or 50 branches would do it differently to a company that has half a dozen small cells of workers and certainly I was with um, a prov several providers over the last couple of months. I mean one provider in the East End of London who provides services to ethnic minority women only. They have a very tight-knit um, uh, relationship with their providers, uh, with, their, with their carers um, and they have um, uh, formal monthly meetings and, and again I was talking to a very large provider, a fairly large provider, they've got 35 odd branches based in the Midlands and South Midlands um, and they have quarterly um, into quarterly meetings with their staff. Um, I think you know it, it's a question of what works best works best. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to uh, impose a model or prescribe a model. Um, I have yet in the two years that I've been with the UK HCA, come across any provider that doesn't engage with their care staff in some form or other. I'm sh I, I have no idea if there, if, if there are any people out there that don't deliberately. I, I have yet to come across anybody that doesn't. We have staffing notices that you have from the care inspectorate are as far as staffing numbers per shift uh, per skill uh, requirement are laid down on our staffing notice. So from the point of view, that's our uh, guide and that's what we stick to. As far as communication, it's very much locally um, uh, done through the manager and deputy manager. I mean, uh, things that happen or, or um, for us is very different from Aberdeen. Um, and actually, Peterhead is very different from Aberdeen, um, we find. So it's very much locally 
um, run. And that's where the quality of the manager uh, and also the deputy manager uh, in, in delivering that. And it's our job to give them as much support to be able to, to do that at the coalface uh, um, as, best, as best they can. No formal structures. That's no. Okay. Uh, Gordon, I, I just before I ask my questions, I just want to correct a couple of things that Duncan White said. One, he says we'll stop training uh, nurses. Well, certainly in my constituency, the university in my constituency is still training nurses. And secondly, you talked about local authority rates being as low as eleven pound fifty odds. Um, the some of the evidence we've received say that the hourly rate for Scottish local authorities is around £13.50. So just to correct those two. But, gentlemen, you're painting a very bleak picture of the the uh, care home sector. And, you know, Mr Kilgore, you referred to Lang and Busson being, Busson being the leading consultants in the sector. They found in a report last year that profits are estimated to be around 8%. They also um, highlighted that per individual in a care home, the weekly profit is between forty-four and sixty pounds per week per person. Um, Grant Thornton issued a report last year that said the care home sector is growing, and wages are typically represent forty-nine percent of revenues. Now, my understanding in most businesses. Revenues represent about two thirds to seventy percent. So, forty-nine percent, according to the findings of the report issued by Grant Thornton last year, would suggest that there is room for manoeuvre. Now, when I would I would challenge a number of those. I can only go by the, the, the well. I can only there. go by what twenty-six years of experience and where I am at the moment with with our business. We are close to sixty-five percent of our income, maybe because um, our percentage of Local authority is 75% local authority fees, which is maybe why. If you have 75% private and 25% local authority, then you may well be down, at, because you have higher fees from the private sector, from, from private residents, you may well be at 49.50. But I can assure you that the industry average um, uh, is, near, is above 60 and nearer 65, and we're at 65 as far as that. As far as the, the profit margin, I don't have a, a problem with telling you that our turnover, employing 650 part and full-time staff, is uh, last year was just over 16 million, and we made a pre-tax profit of 430,000, I think it was, 430,000. Pre-tax profit, where you then pay your tax, you then have your capital repayments for the capital cost to the, uh, to the bank. And then you spend every single penny that you can and more on uh, improvements, whether it's new carpets, new en suites, new furniture. Uh, I don't, I mean, that's a personal thing. I don't take a salary out of the uh, business, haven't done for several years, in fact, probably 10 years. Mm. So there's, there's not fat cats making uh, high percentages um, uh, and moaning about um, being squeezed a bit. We've had eight to 10, well, we've had eight years of of squeeze and pressure on margins, and the margins have gone down. I'd say our margins are about, I mean, if 3% would be uh, um, uh, where I would, if I was asked in a survey, my finance director would tell me, would say that we're about 3%, but that's, that's us. Maybe because we have a, high, mm -hmm. a higher percentage of local authority residents than maybe others who can have a higher, will have a higher profit uh, margin if they have a higher percentage uh, or a lower percentage, shall we say, of local authority residents. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the, the, these figures are, are Grant Thornton's, they're not my figures. So, you know, this is their, their survey of the care home sector. So the, the other thing I was wanting to ask was, um, in the written evidence, there was a suggestion by UKHCA that in order to pay the national living wage, the rate would have to go up to £16.50. Now, I'm trying to work out... What's the difference between the national living wage of £7.85 and an early rate that you would want to charge local authorities of £16.50? Now, I understand you need to pay national insurance, you need to have cover for annual leave, you need to have cover for sickness levels, you need to recover some of your general overheads. But, you know, how does an annualised cost at £16.50 for a typical employee of about £32,000 and you're paying that individual 17 plus on costs, where does that 
difference come in? Does that not cover enough of your overheads? Have any home care businesses? So I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, certainly the model that, that you're quoting, um, and, and I will send you a copy of how it's worked out. Um, it's broken down very graphically um, in terms of the, the cost, of, the actual cost of providing an hour of home care. Um, and with a national living wage, it will certainly go up to £16.70 from 15.74, as is. Uh, uh, under the national, uh, under the minimum wage of six pound fifty, I and mean, those, those costs are, are very easy to recognise if you look through the document that I will send you. Um, you know, there, there's things like registration fees, insurance, uh, tr cost of training, pension contributions, whole plethora of, of, of costs involved in that. And I certainly haven't got the model in front of me, but I can, uh, I absolutely will send it to you. And uh, I'm quite happy to, to come and talk it, talk it through with you. As indeed, I, I sat down with a couple of uh, uh, your staff from um, the, the, the Scottish Parliament uh, account, Health Accounts Department um, three or four weeks ago and went through the costing model with them. Um, it's very transparent. Do your numbers include... These are UK numbers that you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, UK so they nationwide. Include, they include London and the South East, for example. Yeah, yeah, the UK. Yeah, I mean, it's an average of the averages, and I, ex I explain that to every accountant I talk to. It's an average of the averages. Thank you. Um, and then the second point is, I mean, that the, the, the Gordon raised was about nurse training. Um, it's a matter of public record that for every nurse vac never student nurse pl uh, vacancy, there are five applicants. Um, and that the amount of nurses that we are tra training nationally compared to five, six, seven years ago has dropped dramatically. Uh, UK nationally, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure there are individual universities and, and hospitals that are, are above the average. I mean, they have to be. Uh, Good. Uh, thank you. Good morning, and can I uh, apologise for coming in uh, late to the meeting? For once in my life, uh, even I can't blame the Transport Minister for the problem ScotRail is having today. Um, there are several issues which have come up which I think may be relevant to the local government and health committees, and it's possible that uh, we, we might find a way to refer to work that they've done when we look at our conclusions about why this situation exists, uh, and I think some important points have been made. I'd like to ask about the consequences, though, uh, for your businesses and for your employees of very low pay and insecure pay. Um, this will be relevant to the care sector, but, but perhaps beyond so for, for the FSB as well. Can you tell me what you regard the consequences of low and insecure pay to be on running your business? What impact does it have on the uh, sick leave that, that uh, might arise, the, the, the impact that poverty has on your employees' uh, ability to, to do a good job uh, and to, to deliver the services that you deliver? What are the consequences uh, of this problem for those employees and for the quality of the, the services being provided? I certainly think from the UK HCA's point of view, we, we have real concerns about uh, low pay um, and the, uh, the consequences of extended long-term low pay. And our evidence to the Chancellor for the spending review um, that went in a week, ten days ago, whatever it was, explained that our concern is that the polarisation within the UK economy wage uh, structure is locking in institutional low pay. Um, particularly in the home care sector, and I, 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 I used to work in the nursing home care sector 18 or so years ago, and I know that there is a, a mirror problem there. But certainly in the home care sector, we are really profoundly concerned that, that institutional low pay has become an absolute factor of life, and what we see over in the next four or five or six years doesn't fill us with any enthusiasm that, that is going to change any time soon. I think the consequences of low pay are manifest and clear today, and that won't get better. Staff churn, staff turnover, companies scrimping on things like training, uh, making where staff have to buy their own uniform, a whole manner of, of corner cutting and cost cutting issues arise, and, and that is a natural concomitant of a, of a persistent low fee situation. Um, uh, he, he really is the elephant in the room. Is anyone able to uh, give an assessment of the, the, the scale of impact 
for example, on absence due to sickness and stress connected to poverty pay? Um, I mean, certainly we have not undertaken any longitudinal studies of, 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 of those sorts of issues. And I think hearing your question, I probably need to go back to head office and say we've got a bit of work to do, chaps. Um, anecdotally, the stress within the home care service at the coalface, to use a cliche, is undoubtedly ferocious. You know, you are dealing with some of the most deprived, health deficient situations imaginable and working in that environment constantly, carrying all the grief that goes with it does have an absolute impact on your health and your, and your emotional and mental well-being without a shadow of doubt. And, and hands up, I cannot give you any figures here today, but I think we probably need to work on that. I wonder if Mr Kilgar or other, other witnesses want to comment on this. Well, certainly um, low pay uh, or lower pay than we would like to be able to, to pay, even, for example, to compete with uh, local authorities, which we cannot compete with local authorities um, on their uh, pay levels. Uh, um, we can't. Um, staff retention, staff recruitment, um, uh, we feel that obviously staff recruitment, staff retention, sickness levels, w the, if we p were able to pay more, we would, um, uh, those would be affected in a positive, uh, in a positive way. Um, and certainly um, it is a very, it's both a challenging job working at the coalface in the, in the care sector, but it's also extremely rewarding. Um, and uh, I do my utmost to both in, in pay terms, conditions and training opportunities. That's one of the reasons we've taken this initiative of increasing hugely in the last, uh, last from last year, this year, from last year, next year from this year in our uh, uh, training budget because we see that as um, a way. We're trying uh, any and every um, way we can come up with to uh, improve recruitment, improve uh, staff retention and try and improve the 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 pay, what, what the working conditions and also the, ca the capital expenditure that's available to us once we've paid the bank back for uh, um, uh, the capital on, on, on the loans. We, we're spending more than we're earning back in uh, capital expenditure and improving the, um, the quality of the services that we're providing. Thank you. Could I just ask as well about insecure work as well as uh, the, the pay level? Um, one of the care providers who've given us written evidence draw a distinction between uh, the way they organise their casual support workers, uh, a contract in which uh, the employer has no obligation to provide specific hours, so there is insecurity there, but the employee has no obligation to accept the hours that they're given, so the employee can set their own boundaries. They draw a distinction between that arrangement and what they describe as an exploitative zero-hour employer uh, who has contracted the employee to work the hours they give when they are given with no guarantee of ours. Is that a distinction that you recognise? And is what's described as the more exploitative form of zero hours contracts common uh, in the care sector? Well, going by um, our company with 650 uh, staff in total, part and full time, there's 309 full time, 210 part time and 127 bank staff who work varying hours both that suit them and suit us because some of them have other jobs as well. Only the bank staff are on what you would term zero hour contracts. None of them are obliged to take the hours that they're given? No. Okay. Uh, uh, wider within the care sector, is this distinction uh, common? I, I can see where that distinction has arisen from. It, it, I think it's far more subtle than that. Um, and I, I think there are probably not many UK HCA members out there that would recognise the, uh, the, the the black and white division between those two. I think um, zero hours contract has, has latterly uh, managed to, to, to become very sort of unfavourable and, and looked on very unfavourably. I think if, if you call it bank staff, it, it throws it in a completely different light. And there are a vast majority of people who are on zero hours contracts who are 
in practice, in reality, are bank staff, and that is what they want. And certainly when we have undertaken thumbnail examinations, reviews of, of people who work on that basis, the vast majority of people want that sort of arrangement. In which case there'd be presumably no problem in ensuring that they have a right to decide whether they want a, a, a contract specifying hours or a, a flexible contract. I think there, there are a lot of providers out there that would struggle to give fixed term contracts because the nature of the No, no, uh, I'm not suggesting that they, they all sorry. be simply moved to, to a fixed contract. But if you're saying that they are happy with the flexibility as it, as it operates, there'd be no ob objection to ensuring that they have the choice, that the employee can choose whether they want that flexible arrangement or whether I mean, they want I, I, I certainly, I certainly couldn't sit here and, and pretend to speak for all our members in terms of whether they would, would be happy with that or not. But uh, I, I think, you know, I, I revert to what I said a minute or two ago. They are bank workers by another name, and, and that works well for everybody involved. Well, we have, we have um, the requirements under our, the care inspectorate's staffing notices, and if we can't... Um, fill our required at both nursing, care, ancillary, etc. Um, then we go to bank. If we can't through bank, we go to uh, agency, um, and that's another area where the agency costs. I mean, maybe the Scottish government should be capping agency level fees, both for the NHS. I know the NHS has a huge problem with agency fee levels, the same as the voluntary sector and the same as the independent sector. Maybe that's something that the Scottish uh, um, government could look at doing is capping uh, agency fees. That would certainly help. But we, with the vacancies that I mentioned um, earlier, that we have about 57 vacancies across nursing, carers, ancillary, and middle management that the, any bank member, as far as I'm concerned and aware, any bank member that wanted to, to come on a, a, a regular contract, uh, either part-time or full-time, would be able to do that because we have these vacancies. So um, we, 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 we certainly have uh, full-time fixed contract vacancies at the moment. Could I just, if you forgive me, just make a point that's slightly beyond uh, the care sector? Of course. I'm just going to just talk about you know, small businesses in general. I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I'm really pleased that you're making that distinction between different types of zero hours contracts. I'm referring to a distinction that, that's been made in, in written evidence yeah, too. And I think it's, not, it's not my point. But you're right. I think you're, you're, you're right to highlight that. Because I think there are, you know, for a start, small businesses are very unlikely to use any sort of the more exotic forms of employment. We tend to just employ people. Uh, Directly, but there is a distinction between you know where you need that you know flexibility. You know maybe students working in bars or whatever who don't really want to be tied down to certain a, a shifts, and to exploitative employment practices, which tend to be used in you know I think large retail and other places have, have been mentioned, but I'm sure it goes on elsewhere. I think there is very little justification for things like exclusivity deals, or for using um, what's effectively you know a zero hours contract for somebody who has what by you know to anyone else looking in a regular hours of work because what that can do is it can let you know um, unscrupulous employers undercut decent employers by for example sidestepping bits of um, employment law so I think while you know we wouldn't want to see the, the the club completely taken out of the bag. Some, and I accept it's not a um, a matter that anyone in this parliament can um, can sort out. Some relatively straightforward legislative changes um, round about how zero hours contracts can be employed would probably make sense. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. We have we have run a bit over time, but there's just I've got a couple more points I want to cover, and willie has got a, a final point I want to cover. Um, a couple of issues which have come up, maybe I could address this to, to Colin Borland um, in the first instance, and I'll just ask them both together just for the sake of time. The first is the question of conditionality, which we've taken quite a bit of evidence on. So the Scottish Government has it's got its, 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 its um, business pledge that you'll be familiar with, where businesses sign up and they undertake not to use exploitative zero-hour contracts, to endeavour to pay the living wage and, and, and basically be good employers. Um, when we asked the, the enterprise agencies and the other government agencies whether they treated businesses any differently, whether they were signed up to that or not, they told us no. So there's no conditionality. What would be the view of, of FSB and indeed anybody else from the business community who's here 
of whether there should be conditionality. That's the first point. And the second point is we've also heard some evidence about um, employment tribunal fees and the fact that these have been increased by the, the, the UK government. The Scottish government um, wants to see these, when this is devolved, uh, be, be, uh, be reduced. Is there any particular view on that? Um, to deal with the conditionality point first, when the business pledge was um, first announced, we were quite clear that we said it shouldn't be linked to business support. Businesses are already you know, working hard, paying taxes and funding. This is public funded support uh, that we are already paying for. I do think we get into very difficult territory as well when we start talking about making distinctions between good businesses and bad businesses. I think we're all in favour of driving um, better behaviour, sharing best practice and encouraging that. But um, to, for example, say that someone can't walk through the front door of Business Gateway or log on to the Business Gateway website without having um, their pledge card number next to them, you know, this didn't seem right to us at all. I, you know, whether or not some point down the line there might be enhanced services available to those who signed up the pledge is an interesting point. Again, I think we would have some problems with that. I think we would be quite concerned just because this definition of, and I know you'll be probably sick of hearing this, I haven't done this inquiry for as long as you have been, but this definition of what's a good job and what's a bad job, I think is a very difficult one. And if it becomes a mechanical distinction, then um, a lot of our members, just you know, through no fault of their own, are going to lose out. I mean, the, the example that might be appropriate for this morning is it's, it's I suppose the difference between a job in a small business and a job in a bigger business might be the difference between a job of a member of your estimable clerking team and your parliamentary researcher. Now, the clerking team will be on a higher salary, final salary, pension, lots of opportunities to move, get promoted internally, a nice big training budget, all of that sort of stuff looks like a very good job. Your parliamentary researcher is your right-hand man or woman, very close to the ultimate decision maker, seeing a vast range of different activities and getting a huge range of experience, probably conversant on a dozen or more uh, policy topics, knows an awful lot of people. So on paper, that might sound like the worst job. But I, I don't know, I, mean, it, it would, I, I would be very hesitant to... Oh, well, <laughs> I would, yes, well, I would hesitate to describe you as a bad employer. You know, so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, so... Um, so I think until you work out, until we get a better idea about what we mean about good and bad work and good and bad employers, then no, I think conditionality is, is risky. Okay. Second one about employment, uh, employment tribunal fees. Um, yeah, we were, um, we, I mean, we have said we'll be very interested to find out um, how this is going to apply, um, particularly in Scotland, if you have businesses that operate across the UK. We don't want Scotland to become, you know, the Liberia of you know, employment tribunals where people, you know, disputes in England can come up here and ch choke up our tribunals because there's some perceived locus because someone has um, a Scottish office. Um, but, but on, I mean, on the point of principle, I mean, do, do, empl do employers think employment tribunal fees, as they're set now, are set at the right level, or, or should they be? Lower? I can um, uh, speak on that. I, I certainly. Um, we have the fees uh, that have been introduced at UK level covering the UK, and I understand that under the new Scotland Act or under the Smith Commission Scotland Act that, that they will be devolved. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have a problem with them being reduced um, at, at all. I think that the, it's very difficult to consider how, for the whole of the UK, one level, one size fits all or one level fits all. Um, I wouldn't, uh, as has been in the, uh, I understand in the government's, um, Scottish uh, government's plan going forward, if these are devolved as planned, they would scrap them all together. Um, I'd be, I, I wouldn't be in favour of them, not that it's my decision, but I wouldn't be in, in some say not, I wouldn't be in favour of, of the overall scrapping of them. Um, but reducing of the fees uh, down to a lower level, I would totally support, but not uh, the total um, scrapping. I think if you're going to get rid of fees, um, I think you, I would hesitate to do that in isolation because although the decision may seem harsh, it was done for a very good reason, which there was a lot of vexatious cases which never made it anywhere near an employment tribunal. But it was, if you dismiss someone for very good reasons, they would stick in a claim and you would end up, even if it was utterly without merit, you still had to spend time defending that claim 
and all the rest of it. Now, if you're you know, an owner-managed business, you are spending time. Uh, if you're not working, you're not earning. You're spending time away from the business. And I think if we could find a way of making that less controversial, taking those costs for the businesses out, making it a level playing field, we could look at it. But I think simply saying, as of this date, uh, there is no fee. We're going to see, you know, I mean, we saw some, something like an 80% reduction across the UK uh, in, in cases. That's just going to go back up again. I can't see why it wouldn't. Okay, and um, last question. Yes, uh, if I may, just coming back uh, and ask you a very brief answer. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm shared this morning, uh, perhaps excluding the care sector, in terms of employee ownership. Do you think the government and its agencies, including Corporate Development Scotland, are doing enough to support firms looking at the employee-owned or employee shared model? Uh, yeah, personally, I do, actually. I think they're doing a fantastic job with uh, limited resources. Um, they're working very efficiently and, uh, yeah, they're getting, getting the message out there and providing the support that's required of them. Okay. I would agree as well. From the, from the businesses that we spoke to, there did seem to be a, a kind of um, proactive approach from you know, the, the government agencies who have responsibility for you know, promoting EOB as one possible source of um, business activity. So, yes. Colin? Um, I, I, my colleagues are far better qualified to cover than that, I think. Okay. Yes, yes, I don't certainly, know. Uh, the, the limited contact I've had with people in the EOB setup, um, they're very keen. They, they, they're very happy with how things are going. Okay. I take their word for it. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much. And um, we have to draw things to a close. Can I thank you all very much for coming? It's been quite a, a long session, and we covered a lot of uh, a lot of ground and different topics, and it's been very useful to the inquiry. Uh, we'll now uh, suspend briefly and go into private session.